Hi and hello, I'm Lucas Alexander. I'm in the countryside in Denmark. I usually live in Copenhagen. And it was also in Copenhagen that I met Tina Turner for the first time. And I'm here to talk about my life and experiences, my adventures with the greatest of them all, Tina Turner, the Queen of Rock. I'm really happy that you asked me to do this video and to talk about my life and my experiences, my adventures, seeing and meeting experiences with Tina Turner over the years. And we are now in late March 2021. In fact, today, the major new Tina Turner documentary entitled Tina uh, is premiering on HBO. I've been fortunate to see it several times now for the last in the last month, ever since it was it premiered at the Glasgow Film Festival. And it's quite amazing and very dark, very emotional, uh, brilliantly made, very cinematic, and full of great surprises, many wonderful pictures and recordings and films from our archives and things we've never seen before. And as a longtime fan of Tina, it's very, very exciting. Um, I think I'm very fortunate to find Tina in a way in my life when I was just a toddler basically, or at least still in kindergarten. And in that way, I've had, she's been in my life all of, all of my life. And she's been very profoundly important, especially in my young years and my childhood and my teenage years. And during my teens, I had the very, very good fortune. I was very lucky to be able to travel around the world, to see her on her tours. She did, first it was the Foreign Affair Tour. That was the first time I was allowed to go and to see her because during her Break Every Rule Tour in 1987, my parents said, no, 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 you're too young. You cannot go and see her. So I was very, very sad. I was a child, child at that time. So my first experience, and this is almost like a gift from the universe in a way, was on my birthday, on that particular day, on the 22nd of May, 1990, in Copenhagen, where Tina was on her foreign affair farewell tour. <laughs> Thank God it was not a farewell tour, but she's been on quite a few of those. So we are just so fortunate that she has been going strong for all of those years and has kept going on tour at least uh, three times after that. So that was absolutely brilliant because I was still a child uh, back then in 1990 and I went there and I went to the front and when she came down that staircase and to steamy windows, I feel that my life changed because it was so powerful. It was, it was so dynamic, so intense, overwhelming. It seemed like a UFO started up there in the ceiling of the that of the stage, this light started, it was massive. There was smoke and all these different lights, uh, pink, red, blue, greenish lights. 
and it really looked like a UFO was landing. And then suddenly it was revealed that it was this massive staircase, which by the way, later on I discovered was almost a replica of the, stair of the stairs going up to the temple of Hatshepsut, which is this Egyptian pharaoh, female Egyptian pharaoh, who lived thousands of years ago in Egypt. And, and I've been to see Hatshepsut's uh, temple several times. And the second time I was there, I was standing in front of that staircase going up to her temple in Egypt, in Luxor, on the other side, near the Valley of the Kings. I thought, wow, this looks like the staircase that almost like the staircase that Tina came down from on the foreign affair tour. This was incredible to see. And I took a lot of pictures of that. And because I remember Tina saying that she was told by a clairvoyant that she had actually been, that she was the reincarnation of Queen Hatshepsut. And I've always felt a very strong connection with Egypt, which has nothing to do with Tina. It's just very interesting that I also have that, that connection with, with Egypt. So, and I didn't know about those stairs when I, when I went to visit that temple. So it's actually a side note. But when I saw her coming down of those stairs, I had been following her since my early, early childhood, as far back as I, as I can remember. In 1985, I was watching television with my grandmother and there was Tina going totally wild with that wild hair and the voice and the persona and all of what we know her, how we know her. And I was watching, as I said, who is that wild woman? Who is that person? Who is this personality who is like that, who acts this way, who sings like that? I had never seen anybody male or female, uh, be like that, perform like that. And my grandmother said, oh, she's been known for years and years and years. At that time, 10 and 20 years seemed much longer than it does today. It's a strange thing about time, I feel. That's, my, that's how, I, how, how I see it and, and feel, uh, feel it. So, and at that time, it seemed like a long time ago since the early 60s and the late 50s where, when Tina started. And she said, my grandmother said, oh, she's so wild and now she's so much older and this is, how, how out she's outrageous. And the fact that she said that she was a little bit outrageous made me even more fascinated. So I started to collect a few pictures. She was all over at that time, you know, that was her breakthrough with Private Dancer and she was everywhere. And I asked my mother about Tina and she said, well, I used to have albums with Ike and Tina Turner. And I said, you did? And we went to this record shop and I said, I'd love to have one of her albums. And there was Nutbush City Limits, the album from 1973 by Ike and Tina Turner. And my mother said, that was the album I used to have. She had also, she also had the Working Together album by Ike and Tina Turner from uh, 1970. But that Nutbush album, she bought that for me before I got Private Dancer. So that was actually my introduction to Dina. Re imagine putting on the pickup, which is what we, you know, <laughs> an old gramophone, an old, um, LP that we put on back then. Um, and then listening to that sound of Nutbush and then her voice just w went through this large room that we were in. I remember we were decorating the room because my mother had just moved. So, and I thought this was mesmerizing, incredible, extraordinary. It wasn't about her being older at the time. I mean, imagine not older. She was only in her early mid forties. <laughs> and today age is not, you know, it's not very important actually in the same way because people are younger 
you know, for a long time now. And but back then it was very special. And her comeback was extraordinary and she reinvented herself. And then we were told about her tragic story, life story with Ike Turner. But that was not the reason why I was interested. It was just that she was fascinating. The music was soothing in a way, even though I was fired up, full of energy. It was amazing. And it was Nutbush. So it was actually her work with Ike that got me started into collecting all of those albums. And I was still such a little child. So I just, you know, I, I saved up money and I, you know, I asked, you know, for birthdays and Christmas gifts for albums and, and I got them and I got her latest album at the time, Private Dancer. And since that time I've been following her. So in my, in my childhood, I always felt that, you know, I was different. I was unusual, which I still am. But at that time, I thought the world was a strange place, but Tina was something you could depend on. She was something that felt like home. It was like a spiritual connection. So when people say, why Tina? And I said, I don't know why Tina. I don't know that. I don't have an answer for it. The only thing I can say is that, okay, she's, of course, a great, great singer, great performer, the best performer. Nobody has ever been like Tina before Tina, during Tina, or after Tina. And I don't think anybody will top her or even get to go to that level in the future. I'm just really very happy that I got to see so much of Tina's uh, during her comeback years because I wasn't even born when she left Ike, only uh, some years uh, after. And so what was amazing was that I started so early and I got to see her so early because for so many years we haven't had any anything from Tina and, you know, it's been more uh, the best of albums and then she's done the spiritual beyond albums after she totally retired and then the musical which is absolutely amazing really everybody must go and see that musical wherever they are when when everything opens up again after this corona crisis then hopefully people can go to broadway to the west end in london to hamburg and to amsterdam and wherever they will open i know that they will open in madrid as well they should go and see the musical of tina because it's amazing and it's a really well made and produced by Tina and Irvin Bach, her husband. So, but even though it's amazing and even if it's absolutely incredible, it's of course not Tina. And the movie What's Love Got to Do With It, brilliantly played by Angela Bassett, is of course not Tina as well, but it, it is the essence of, of her. So why her? Well, the wild hair, the short skirt, her being sexy, raunchy, fantastic, warm, funny, wild, everything you can imagine. A little bit out there, actually, because, you know, she's not usual, she's unusual. And I think that's what a lot of people are gravitating to when they become a, a very special kind of fan of Tina. There is, there are millions of people around the world who consider themselves to be fans of Tina. And then there's this so-called Our Tina Family, where we are a lot of very, very uniquely different people, but we are a group of people that have been in contact for, some of us for 25 or 30 years, and some for 10 years. And it's a very uh, interesting and wonderful experience being with all of those people from all over the world. But Tina is, for me, beyond the beyond. She is beyond the image. It's beyond that tragic life story with Ike. It's beyond all of that. I feel, personally, for me, it's like a spiritual connection. It's something 
elusive, something beyond what you see, what you hear. It's almost like she's from another planet, from another world. She does things differently. It is all of the things you can't see, all of the things you can't hear. It is an energy, a frequency, a vibration, like Nikola Tesla said, that comes out, that oozes out from her. It's, I think it's her soul, the spirit within. And that's what makes me very fascinated with her in a way. Because again, I say, it's not about her being a woman or a man or black or white or anything like that. It's about that incredible persona, which is different. You'll notice it as well. All of the years she worked with so many different sets of eye cats, her three uh, backing singers and and dance uh, dancers, the three girls that she always had on the stage, and there were many different sets of eye cats. And later on in her solo career, she had many different sets of dancers as well. And when they do the same move, the same dance move, the same routine, Tina always does it differently. She's always uniquely different from the rest of the people who are doing the same. But it's not the same. And those of you out there who are big fans, you'll know exactly what I talk about. And that's why it's very dif uh, difficult for an impersonator or somebody playing Tina in the musicals or in movies or wherever to get that totally even though some of them are absolutely brilliant because it's something you can't, I don't think you can work on that. I don't think it's something there is and it, it's in her and that's what makes her very special. It's that thing you can't see that I talk about, which I find amazing. So my first experience meeting her, well, I saw her, as I said, on my birthday in 1990, and I got to see a couple of shows. And then in 1993, I was supposed to go to Lüneburg in Germany. I believe it was Lüneburg. I can't remember totally. I think it was where she did a few festival concerts during her What's Love tour in 93. But that never happened because I was in school and, you know, I couldn't afford it. And I don't know what the whole thing was. I can't remember. I just remember me being absolutely unhappy about it. So then came Wildest Dreams, the Wildest Dreams tour in 1996. And that was the year where nothing could stop me. I was a teenager. I wanted it. I, I thought about it, I had the thought, law of attraction, I wanted it, and certainly it happened. So I had the opportunity through several friends, through my family, through different people that I already had become friends with from all over the world, uh, through the International Tina Turner Fan Club, which was brilliantly run by, by Ella Deneman from Holland, from Amsterdam. And she's one of my great friends also today. We went basically all over the world, at least all over Europe. And then, you know, a lot of people also went to the States. I've only been one time to the States. I've been a lot to the States, but I have only seen her once there. But in Europe, we went all over. I mean, I can't remember all of the dates and I don't remember how many shows but we went all over uh, Europe and saw Tina and I became friends with a lot of very very different very wonderful older and younger well there was a few younger than me but I think I was the one of the if not the youngest the youngest then at least one of them during uh, that uh, tour and all of those experiences. I had a very good friend here in Denmark and I traveled a lot with 
him. He had his motorbike, and on that was the description, Tina Turner. He even had her face and whatever tattooed on, on his arm. And a lot of people think, oh, that fandom is so crazy. And it is. It is. And, you know, today being grown up and doing, you know, so many other things and other things are very important and take up your time and uh, other things are interesting for you, then, yeah, of course, when you look back, it's a little bit uh, crazy and funny and whatever. But it's also beautiful and it, you know, it gave me so many amazing moments in my life. And I wouldn't, I can't imagine who I would have been today if I had not had those experiences. Because this was traveling the world. We saw the most amazing places and cities. And sometimes we didn't have time or the money to, to spend on a hotel. So we spent the night in a telephone booth, which was also there in, in the past. <laughs> this was 1996. And we went, we went to shelters and uh, different places. Sometimes we lived at very nice hotels. So it was, you know, it was a thing. It was basically about going to all of those shows. And it wasn't that, you know, it was the same show every, every day. But it was never the same thing. It was that amazing togetherness with all of these people. Being in those stadiums and in those halls, arenas. And even though Tina did basically the same, it was always a little different. And it was that those moments that were unique. And it was on that tour. So it, I skipped school a lot. My parents, especially my dad, was not happy. But uh, I, had to, I had to do it. And sometimes you just have to go for your wildest dreams. So it was, of course, Tina. But it was also the, the unity of being with all of these amazing people. So... Tina had been on a lot of her German, Germany, the part, the leg of the tour, Wildest Dreams, 96. And I knew that she had one week, almost one week, or at least five or six days off from her, from her um, concert in, in Bremen, in Germany. Her next concert was in Copenhagen, where I live. So I thought I knew how they worked, you know. After the show, she went to the to the airport and she would go to the next city. So I thought she's going to Copenhagen. So she's going to be there for 5 or 6 days before the show. Ha. Huh. Very 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 interesting. I thought this could maybe be my opportunity to get to meet her. And I knew the hotel. I already figured out that this would be the hotel, the Hotel d'Angleterre in Copenhagen, in the, one of the big squares. Very beautiful old hotel. She'd stayed there before. She stayed there in 1990 and went out of the site entrance. So I thought, my God, she's going to be there. And on that, the following night, the... Danish television news, TV1 in Denmark, interviewed her on at that hotel. And so did VH1. They did a special on Tina. Uh, I think it was called 2020 or something. You see her in a kind of a restaurant. She talks about Janis Joplin. She talks about her life story. They did quite a few of the documentaries there in, in Copenhagen during that, that week. So on that night, this she was in Bremen on Sunday, and on Monday, I believe, Brian Adams played, did a huge concert at Parkin Stadium, the same stadium where Tina was going to perform the following Friday. Brian Adams, Tina, at the same hotel, at the same time, good friends who sang It's Only Love, and then later on, a few years later, on her 24-7 album, they did um, another song together that he wrote for her. I can't remember the name of that song right now. 
It will come to me in a moment. How can I not remember? Okay, anyway. So, I mean, get older so you can't remember all of the things. It will come to me in a moment. Everybody will say, don't you remember that song? I, of course I do. Um, without you. Yeah, there it was. Without you, it's called on the 24-7 album. <laughs> so don't say I don't remember. Anyway, Brian Adams was going to do this uh, concert and I thought, Tina is in town. They're at the same hotel. Could Tina actually join Brian Adams at Parkin Stadium? Hmm. This was very puzzling. So, we, a few friends of mine, we and myself, we went to Parkin Stadium. We didn't have a ticket for Brian Adams. So, you know, how, how, how could we get in? So I was very young, young teenager, and I was, you know, a little bit, you know, I was just happy. And I went to some of the security people there and I said, you know, I really want to get in. Can we, how can we get in? He said, no, 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 there's no tickets and you can't get in and stand back. And he said, but please, can we do, how can we do, how can we get in? We need to get in. We couldn't get tickets. We have to get in, please. And I was very, you know, nice. So I bribed the security man, 100 kroner, which is not, you know, a lot. Uh, maybe it was a little bit more then, doesn't matter. If I bribed him, and he said, okay, well, we can go in, you know. And he said, I need my friend there. Okay, 100 kroner, they get all, so you can go in. We went in there. We went into Parkin Stadium. I had a little video camera with me, which I had in my bag. And, of course, you cannot bring that out because then they'll take it. But then he started, Ryan Adams, saying, Oh, I did this duet with this, the Queen of Rock, this amazing woman. Do you know who it is? And everybody was screaming and shouting, Yes. He said, Yes, it's Tina Turner. So I pressed record on that, uh, on the video cam recorder, old-fashioned one that I had at the time. And so I was waiting for her to come on stage, but she didn't appear. She was not there. She didn't come on, but her voice came on. Me knowing exactly how the recordings are, this was not a recording. This was live. And I was wondering, wow, she is here. She is at the stadium in the back or sitting up in the VIP section we, we discovered. And she was singing from there because she had her big, she was going to do her big show the following Friday. And this was Monday. This was on the 17th of June, 1996. I remember those dates totally. Um, and uh, she was going to do uh, her show on the 21st of June. So she was there and she didn't want to be seen yet. This, I'm sure this is the reason because, you know, if anybody who had been there had already seen her, you know, then what's the thrill about going on, on Friday? And I guess a lot of the same people would also go to Tina's show. But there was the song and she was there. It sounded incredible. As soon as that song was over, I, you know, and the concert continued we went out of the stadium as fast as we could. We took a taxi directly to the Hotel d'Angleterre. And, and my friend at the time, who was, I was traveling around with, also with to see Tina. We uh, I went to the front and I said, no, we're not going to go to the front. She's going to go to the back, back entrance. So we ran to the back entrance. And I tell you, I don't think we had been there more than five minutes. There came the limousine. And she, they couldn't get in because the gates were still closed to the hotel. So I ran up to the window and, you know, did some gestures or whatever. And the, and the windows were totally black. You couldn't see any, you couldn't see anything. And as the window came down, Tina's face was revealed with a big smile. I have the pictures. And I was like, I said, I must compose myself. I, I had to, you know, 
had to, Tina, Tina, I, you know, this is an incredible moment. I love you. You're amazing. It's, uh, can we please meet? Can we, can I please have a moment with you? Can we please talk together? Can we, can we, can I have a picture taken with you for this memory? I'm traveling all over to see your shows. I'm on your tour following you. Please let us have this moment. She said, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, we can do that. We can do this set. But please, Tina, please promise me. Promise me. You got to promise me. And she, then she laughed and laughed and laughed. They said, ha, ha, ha. And you know how Tina laughs. And I, I said, but Tina, please promise me. In front of her, she was sitting in the middle. Roger was sitting here. And her assistant and personal assistant, uh, um, I don't remember his name, but he was the one that came later after Eddie Amani had, um, that they were not together anymore. Then he kind of took, he kind of did for her what he had done in the past. He was sitting on the other side. Roger was there. Patrick, her um, bodyguard and, yeah, bodyguard, security man, was sitting uh, next to the driver. So I, so I turned to Roger and said, Roger, and then he knew, I knew who he was. Roger, please make this happen. Please promise me that we can have this moment. Just a couple of us. And he said, yes, yes, I'll promise you I'll be out in the front later. And he did. He went out to get some takeaway food. And I said, could, could we meet Tina? And he was wonderful. I have to say, Roger Davis was always wonderful, always great, always very nice. And such a good guy. And I had so many great moments with him uh, during these early teen years. And so he said, no, Tina right now is in the bath. And I, th I, I thought he said, because he said the ball, you know, he's from Australia. So I, th I thought he said, and I said, but then we can go. We can go. We can, then let's go. Can we go now? Or is, is that even possible? Can we go and see her then? He said, but she's in the bath. And I thought he said that she was in the bar. B-A-R, not in the bath. So, so when I said, can we go while she's in the bath? I don't think so. So, um, okay. So he said, in the bath. Oh, excuse me. I didn't hear it. So, uh, but later on that night, Tina actually walked in the reception and went into the bar which she had done that interview with VH1 earlier on in, in the day. A lot of people, a lot of fans will know what, what interview we're talking about. So, so Roger went out and he said, no, no, you can, we, you can come on, uh, on Thursday to meet her. And he told us the time when we had to be there. And he said, be there at least uh, 10 to 15 minutes before. Uh, and of course we were there an hour before or something. So, but, uh, when we went back on Thursday, Tina had gone, uh, home to Ville, Villefranche-sur-Mer, where she was building her house in the south of France, in near Nice. She had gone home because of the construction workers or whatever it was. I don't, I don't recall, but it was something like that. So she had gone home for a day or something. And so what happened was she said, no, we, it cannot be today. It must be tomorrow, but she'll arrive soon. And um, she did. She went in and she was alone in the car this time. And she was just waving and we filmed her and she said, and I said, oh, you remember kind of, you know, gesturing, like, remember we have to meet. And she said, yeah, yeah, and waved. So that was a, that was a fun thing. So already there, it was like, yes, this can happen. They have agreed to this and it, it is going to, to take place. So on the next day, the 21st of June, 1996, on the day where she was going to perform at Parkin Stadium in Copenhagen, Denmark, we came at the arranged time, I think about two, two o'clock in the afternoon, the hotel. Roger and Patrick Prendergast, his name was, Tina's security man, a really nice guy as well that I got to know quite well during, those, during that tour and then the next one, he was also on that tour 24-7 in 2000. Um, 
they came out and they took four of us through the corridors of the hotel. It was like almost, you know, it was amazing going through the reception, the corridor, beautiful, you know, that beautiful place there. And then we went to the back and then through the kitchen, not so beautiful, and then into the backyard of that hotel. And there she was standing um, with her back looking in that direction so we could only see her back. And there she was. And we walked down and she was still looking in that direction so we could see her from the back. So, and then she turned around and just, I just fell into her embrace and she gave me a massive hug and she was so wonderful and so nice and so calm, very wise. Actually, there was this sensitive thing about her and very different from when I met her later on at her birthday party in Germany in November of the same year, on the 25th of November, the day before her uh, 57th, well, birthday that she celebrated during her, the concert she did at, in, at Westfalen Halle in Germany. She was very, you know, the Tina we've seen, ha ha ha, and hello, and yes, and she was talking to everybody and hugging and, you know, but I'll get to that in a moment. At the, in this backyard of the hotel down the Terre in Copenhagen, she was very beautiful, very charming, very sensitive, I felt. And we had some wonderful moments with her. She gave us a lot of time. We took a lot of pictures and she signed my shirt on me. I can still feel that, you know, when she was signing my name and her name on, on my chest, on the shirt, never put it on since. And we took a lot of pictures and I told her I was following her tour and, and that I had been a fan for, at that time, 11 years. And she said, oh, you must have been really young. I said, it was just a small child and I'm a teenager now. And we talked about Wembley Stadium because she was going to perform there a month after that day. And she said, oh, Wembley is going to be great. And this was the first time she had actually played Wembley Stadium. Later on in 2000, they of course filmed the DVD one last time on her 24-7 tour at Wembley Stadium. And I'm, I'm in the video as well. Happily, I have to say, this is a wonderful memory that we were there. They filmed it during the two dates that she was there and mixed it together. But Wembley, of course, uh, was a major thing at that time. And, you know, she was doing only stadium shows for that whole summer in Europe. And then she went into lots of arenas when, you know, during the fall and the winter before she went to America in, in, the, in early nine, 1997 for the, the American leg of the tour. But that was the most extensive, extensive long, groundbreaking, record-breaking tour of any performer ever. And she had already broken the record cord of, you know, um, attendance, uh, one, 186,000 people, I believe, in Rio de Janeiro in January uh, 1988. At that time, on that day, I was sitting there watching television because it was transmitted on television. I was like, oh, this is amazing. I didn't have a VCR at the time. I couldn't tape tape it. So I had to, I used a tape recorder. I had a tape recorder standing next to the television where the sound came out. So I could record the sound from then. And they, later on, of course, we got the VHS and the DVD, whatever. But um, this, this was also an amazing memory. But meeting her there at the hotel was extraordinary. Great memory, wonderful experience, a very close experience I will treasure forever. To meet one of those people that means so much to you. And you never thought, oh, can you even get to meet some, somebody like that that you admire a lot? 
and that was a beacon of light in a way for for me as she has been for a lot of people um, um, who has been following her for a long time she is a, a strength and a power and unique for different reasons she went into the car after we had talked and she signed and we took pictures and had a great moment. She was not in a hurry, which was amazing. And then she was, she went into the car and, and we went out and followed her. And then when we came out, they couldn't turn the car because there were some bikes standing there and she, and some bikes came and she said, she opened up, she said, no, 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 stand back because don't be run, be careful that you don't get run over. And then she was waving for as long as we could see her. And then she had to go to the rehearsal at Parkin Stadium. And ha, oh, that night was amazing. Also, you know, this was during a, this is still light when, when she went on because, you know, the, the summers in Scandinavia the, gets dark very, very late. I remember she grabbed somebody's teddy bear that flew through the stadium and she, she just grabbed it in, in the air. And everybody, and she stopped the whole thing and stopped the music and she said, I want to know exactly who gave me that teddy bear. And that person ah, screamed and shouted and she just kept on kissing that teddy bear so you could see the lipstick. And then she said, okay, I'm going to throw it back to you. And, may, and I'll, I won't go on until I make sure that you get that so somebody else doesn't get it. So she made sure of that. And this was this is also a fun memory, but we have... A million of those during the times of of um, uh, traveling uh, around w with her uh, and and seeing all of the shows. Later on, I was fortunate enough to get a, an a, an all not an all access pass, but access to the stadium, so we could get in there before the crowd went in, because usually we ran to the front and was waiting for hours. Of course, Ella Deneman, the 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 fan club president, she had one and she was in there along with a few of the the fans that were always there there was a couple of german ladies and and a couple of german guys they were always there as well and i we you know we traveled i guess everywhere so um it was an amazing time uh, as i said getting you know becoming friends one became like a little sister to me and we you know we've been we grew up together in that way and known each other ever since and was become my very close personal friend almost part of the family and a friend of mine also from England that is very close to me to this day and some of these people are just very closely related and it's thanks to Tina even though we don't talk about Tina necessarily occasionally if there's something but there hasn't been a lot in the last 20 years actually and it's been 20 two years this year since she released a full studio album which i could also i also have an opinion about because you know i mean even though even if you didn't have to promote it so much then maybe you could she could have made other albums as well but you know there's a lot of the best of albums and some b-side singles some extra bonus songs and you know it's she's not been that productive but all of the albums that she did make in her solo career was absolutely uh, wonderful. I think, without a doubt, my favorite album is Foreign Affair that she did in 1989. I remember going to the record store on the day that it was released, and I remember them unpacking them in the, you know, in these papi mache or whatever, these cases that came in. And they were like opening, opening with a box cutter and took out the album and we'd never seen it before, not even the pictures. Um, and it was, um, it was amazing. It was such a special feeling about that Foreign Affair album. It's her best album, in my opinion, of all of the albums she's ever made. That one she cannot, she could never top. I mean, I don't even think she could make an album after that that would be that good. The feeling was there. She connected with her blues roots and 
the Tony Joe White connection with all of her his wonderful songs that she covered and did and recorded. I don't know if they were for the first time, but I know that Tony Joe White also re recorded them. What they what he calls Swamp Rock. That whole album was amazing. My second favorite is Break Every Rule, and third favorite, well. I don't know, maybe Private Dancer, I guess. But there are many songs and different albums that I really like. To me, Tina could have done a lot of, well, if not heavy metal, maybe that's a stretch because that wasn't the style of music that she, she did. But she did have that kind of voice, that heavy metal kind of voice. Same kind of a voice, that same kind of raspy, raw voice that Bonnie Tyler also has. but. She's doing a lot of very pop ballad, no offense, but a little bit cheesy songs. Some of them are very, you know, popish, where, you know, a really strong rock song could very well fit the voice. And Tina, of course, has done a lot of the wild rock songs as well. I wish she had, she had done a little bit more of that in the style of Steamy Windows, Nutbush, City Limits, Back Where You Started, Steel Claw. Do what you do, 24-7, whatever you want, not whatever you need. She did another song called what, Whatever You Need, but it's the Whatever You Want song that is that stand out. The other one is very nice as well. We also love her ballads, of course, but I'm actually more into the rough rock stuff, more so than What's Love and the nicer songs. Um, I like the, the, the more powerful uh, songs that she did. But of course, as a good old fan, being brought up with Tina, she can do no wrong. So she can sing anything like row, row, row your boat. And we would love it. And guess what? She did sing that song. <laughs> so that was also uh, a lot of fun. It's always great to hear her sing other things as well. Then we, we were invited to her birthday party special invite for selected fans from all over the world, at least in Europe. 19 selected fans that were chosen to go to a meet and greet birthday party celebration in a big room in Westfalen Halle in, Dor in Dortmund, Germany. And it was the day before her 57th birthday. One show I wasn't I wasn't there in uh, where was it Frankfurt? It was one of the one or two shows in Frankfurt I didn't go to, and that was the day where Tina had chosen some people to go. Or Patrick went to tell uh, to tell Ella Deneman from the fan club who uh, they wanted to include for this birthday party. And he said, where is Lucas or where, where are the two Danish guys? And then the next day, Ella called me and said, you've been chosen to come with us to Tina's birthday on the, on the 25th of November in Dortmund. This was amazing. And, uh, and Ella and I and the other people that we were together with uh, at that at this party the German fans that also were wonderful people. We had an amazing time. Somebody had made a cake with a little figure in marzipan with Tina knitting because she did that in a video with Barry White, which was like an animated cartoon like video of of the title song Wildest Dreams and she had a lot of fun seeing that cake and she was wonderful. She took the flowers, she gave us lots of hugs, we took lots of pictures, she was so nice. And she gave us a tape with a wrapped in gold, gold wrapping of her singing Not Bush with the fans. Unfortunately, I'm not in it. So that was a very sad uh, thing for me that I wasn't in that particular recording because every night she always went down to all of us and she sang with me basically every night and all was oh, look not bush one more time not bush one more time and then at the 24 7 tour it was 24 7 then we did that one so i had so many amazing memories of singing with her when she came down with the 
with the microphone and gave and handed that to to us and you know that was a wonderful time every time we 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 went to the shows but that that was the frankfurt show that that i didn't go to when they went where they invited us for for the show for 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 the birthday uh, meet and greet and they filmed that but i put the tape on youtube so people can see it years ago and it's a very wonderful and you can see how long tina spends there and sometimes she would spend even longer longer uh, time with with us down down there so that was a that was a great thing and that moment at the birthday party was amazing you know and you know it shows the more it showed the more um performer side of tina not the more quiet one that i met in copenhagen but the you know wild funny she's laughing she's over the top she's you know happy and it was brilliant and a lot of fun and i took some great pictures with all of them and also with ella and i you know say yeah do you know that this is the fan club president and she said, yeah yeah i know and she's you know it was it was a great time and those who attended it will will actually absolutely say that that we had a great moment there so that was a great time and i got to see her also several times during the taping of different um television shows there was a couple in denmark that was in advertendas in germany and uh several others i went on on the stage with her it was arranged when she did the the rehearsal with all of the children at the Hans Christian Andersen show in Copenhagen at Parken Stadium, where after the show they gave her a lot of very bad press because they gave her a million dollars to perform and come out of retirement. She said no, and then they said, would you come for two songs for one million? She didn't know what it really was. Said, of course she would, and who wouldn't? And then they gave her a lot of bad press because they didn't make a lot enough returns, but that wasn't her fault. But since that time, she never returned to Denmark, and she always been there ever since Ike. She was always in Denmark and many times, so that was a little bit sad. So on her final tour, on the fiftieth, the fiftieth anniversary tour that started in two thousand and eight and two thousand nine, the last time we saw Tina on the stage. I went to many shows as well, a lot of shows, but not as many as I had done for Wildest Dreams and 24-7. Nothing will top Wildest Dreams and 24-7 was an amazing tour as well. The 50th anniversary tour, we, I also filmed some great things during the shows from front row and we went to different parts of the world as well, but my life was quite different at the time much older and you know you you can only do a lot as uh, so much you can only do so much but for tina you can do even more and just the fact that she came back at this time was brilliant extraordinary and amazing and i'm so grateful that we got the opportunity to see her a lot on that tour as well even though the prices for a lot of people had gone up uh massively it was a quite a different setup at that time but the, she was brilliant, she was extraordinary, and she was 70, imagine that. So we got to see her for so many years, and it was, it was really great.
And I remember during the 24-7 tour, I, I was also at some of the hotels and talking to the band. That was wonderful. I loved the, the guys from the band. And I remember Ollie, her keyboard player, Ollie Molland, came down with a CD that she had just recorded with her of Baby, You're a Star. Nobody had ever heard it before. He gave it to me and said, now you have this, I want to give this to you. And he said, oh. he went back up to his room and to, to get it. That was wonderful. And then later on, it was used for some commercial or whatever it was, but, but her backing singers and dancers were singing it um, solo during one of her costume changes on the, uh, on the, on the show. Um, at 24-7 in 2000. And so I met Roger who came from, you know, on the street. Uh, he came from the gym and so he put his arm around my shoulder and we walked back to the hotel. As I said, Roger was always really nice and it was great experience also having met him and some of the people behind the, behind the, behind the scenes there. It was a fun and wonderful warm thing for me during my formative years and you know becoming what I later became more of we're traveling the world doing lots of things becoming a performer and entertainer myself not in the style of Tina but my own style and and of course she was an inspiration but as I say she it's beyond that um Rhonda Graham was Tina's personal assistant for 55 years. It's a very sad thing that Rhonda died two months ago in January 2021, and we are now in late March. So it's a sad thing, and I'm very sad about that because it was so brilliant and so amazing to get to know her a little bit and to do what I think is, I mean, modestly saying because it would have been anyway if I had not done it but I had the good fortune and I was very lucky to do that interview with Rhonda at the Tina Turner Museum at the West Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, uh, Tennessee near Nutbush where Tina grew up where we went to as well in 2016 and Rhonda was there with Robbie Montgomery, Miss Robbie, who was the first set, the original Iket, one of the, the original Iket's for about five years. She was there as well at this wonderful museum that they did. Uh, they transformed her old school house um, to the museum with costumes and all of, all of the things. So if you go to Nutbush, if you go to Brownsville ever in Tennessee and you want to visit Graceland anyway or with Elvis, you have to go to Brownsville and see the Tina Turner Museum. Rhonda was there. I uh, spoke to her about doing an interview. She was reluctant because she didn't know what I was going to ask her and she didn't want to go into the details of all of the violence with Ike and the beatings that Tina had to go through and everything we'll see here in this new documentary about Tina coming out today on the 27th of March 2021, which is a very dark and but also a powerful and, and wonderful documentary, I have to say. Um, but Rhonda didn't want to talk about that. Uh, so And also the fact that Rhonda was Ike's first wife, uh, white girlfriend at the time. So that was also a lot of that, those things that you see also in the musical. And Tina has written about it and Rhonda has spoken about it. So I said, but we don't have to talk about that. We can talk about all of the other things. The Tina's career, your career. It was about making a portrait of a woman who devoted her life, gave her life actually, to Tina and to be at, you know, to work for her and to be part of music history. And I don't think uh, she was valuable in so many areas. It's, you, you can't even say how many, because she was a very, very, very important and instrumental part 
of Tina's life and career, being a tour manager for the Ike and Tina Turner Review and later on a personal assistant. After that, we had a really good time and she was very happy with the interview and she thanked me for it. And we went around and I felt it was a special connection. I really felt that. And I will treasure that always. And I'm very happy that she was very happy and she got to see the, the interview afterwards and, and really liked it. So thank God she got to see it and that we could honor her in that way because she deserves it. And she, of course, was deeply instrumental in creating this new documentary by these uh, Oscar-winning filmmakers who are behind the new Tina documentary. And Rhonda is in it, although she is ill. Uh, but she did it, and she looks great. And and you know, and what she has to share, her information is very, very vital and very important. So the first time I met Rhonda was in 1999. I had seen her before on the tour, but never got to speak to her. It was at a hotel, the Hotel Phoenix in Copenhagen, while we were there with a the band. And and Rhonda came down. I said, Rhonda. She said, Oh, you know who I am. I said, Yeah. Of course, you're almost as famous as Tina. I said, well, who, are you kidding me? She was a little bit tough, you know? And then, and I said, well, at least in Tina's circles, you are. And she said, yeah, but Tina wants me to go and get something for her and it has to be done now. So she couldn't really talk. She said, when I come back, I'll come down. So she came down and it was great to meet her. And I showed her some pictures of me and Tina and I had changed my appearance rapid enormously you could hardly recognize me and she said is that you in this picture i said yeah it is me and she said then she said thank god for changes i'll never forget that that uh, line and I, I that sentence and i reminded her of it she didn't remember but i reminded her of her saying that when i first met her and she she laughed so that was a, that was kind of that was a fun thing so rest in peace, Rhonda, and thank you for the warmth and all of the wonderful uh, things that you did by being at the Tina Museum with lots of people for, you know, a few years. And it's absolutely great. So in 1997, on I think in February at some point, Tina was on Larry King Live. I called Larry King live. I kept redialing. I was busy. You know, you couldn't get through. Nobody could ever get through. But I, I was lucky. I got through. And I got to ask her a question. And I asked the woman who picked up the telephone saying, CNN, Larry King live. Questions for Tina Turner. Hello. And I said, well, hello, I know Tina because, you know, I've just, you know, I've been on the tour. She knows who I am. I just was at her birthday party a couple of months ago. And, you know, I'd like to say hello and blah, all of this. No, you can't say all that on, on the air. Just ask a direct question. And that's what I did with kind of a British sounding accent at the time. Still a teenager, huh? Copenhagen, Denmark. Hello. Hello, Tina. Hello. My question for you is. Have you yourself ever had any idols, and who are your own favorite actors and actresses? Who flips you? All right. Um, my one idol was Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. I would say um, her grace, her style, her intellect was how I, how I modeled myself in terms of how I wanted to present myself off stage, so to speak. My, for my work, of course, the guys, the Stones, Rod Stewart, the rock and roll guys. That was what I wanted, and that's what I did, and that's how it is. Did you ever get to meet Jackie? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you want to hear the story? Yes. Well, I was, we were checking into a hotel, and for some reason, she was there, and uh, she, at the time, she was with uh, Mr. Onassis. And I was standing uh, at the reception, and I looked down, and I, I wasn't sure that it was her. But then she, she made a gesture of how she usually carried her person. And before I knew it, I was running towards her. I was totally out of control. <laughs> and by the time I got to the door, the swinging doors, I said, oh, oh, Miss Kennedy, oh, I mean, Miss Onassis. I was totally just besotted. And she turned very gracefully like me. She said, I said, oh, I'm Tina Turner. 
I said, I just wanted to say hello. And she extended her hand and had this big smile on her face. And I thought, oh, saved. You know, I, I mean, she could have been very rude. Actually, the lady, I mean, of course she could have been, but she wasn't. She was very kind. And the, who was rude was the lady standing with her. She was looking down her nose at me like I was some disease. And so uh, she says, oh, hello. She says, my children would be pleased. And we had just played high in a sport. And I had been with uh, Robert Kennedy's family, and we had been boating and dancing with them. And, and so they had told Caroline and, um, and um, John, John John. And so, therefore, she knew who I was. And then I said, I was very excited, and then she shook my hand and left. And as I turned, there was Mr. Onassis, and I said, hi! Oh, I had to control myself. And I went, oh, hello. And I went to my room, and I was sitting, and the sofa was just going whoop, 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 whoop. So I can understand sometimes now when some People of the fans come. Way, yes, yeah. I, I try to be as compassionate as I can because I can relate. And as you explain to yourself, and you continue to lose it, even remembering it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes. She, she yes. obviously was a major idol. Oh, she was bigger than life. She was absolutely wonderful. I asked her about her favorite actors and actresses. And she, I don't think she understood the question. I don't know. But she, she, she's, she ended up talking about her inspiration in the rock field, in music. But I asked her about her, I knew those, I knew what she was inspired and who, by and who she liked, but I w wanted to know about her favorite actors and actresses, but that one we never got to hear. However, what was interesting is that she said that her big inspiration and her big idol was Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And I had heard that before, but it was after that that became, after I asked that question, that it became a little bit w more widely known that Jackie Kennedy had actually been a big inspiration for Tina. And she is talking about it with such enthusiasm and she can really feel it. You can see that on the Larry King show when she answers the question. And, and she also says, therefore, I know how a lot of my fans feel when they meet me. However, I still don't think to this day Tina knows how much she's treasured and loved and admired and how much she means to people. That, that beacon of light, that whatever it is that she has inside, whatever is not the visible, on top of all of the visible, and what you hear, her voice and everything, I don't think she knows how much she means to people. I don't think she's capable of knowing. So that's an important thing to also say, because she means a lot. Different things, for different people, different strokes for different folks, but she is loved, supported, and valued to this day, every day. And her groups on Facebook and uh, Instagram and wherever shows how much. People value her every day and the work that she has done. About the, uh, but so, okay, yeah, Larry King, wonderful opportunity. How amazing was that? Absolutely great that I got through. This is like uh, a great manifesting thing that also happened during those uh, things, all of those years there. So, um, Ike Turner, the man that has been portrayed as this devilish person who was cruel and violent to Tina and who was also controlling and quite violent to other people. But he's also, you know, it's also known that he was very charming and helpful and he did a lot of things for a lot of people. And he may have been controlling, but his show worked. And if we are only going to focus on all of the positive things about Ike and Tina Turner, and not all of the bad stuff, which you see in the documentaries and you hear about and the press focus on all the time, then let's focus on the good things. The past is the past. And they were together for 18 years and they worked together for 16 years. And during those years, let's talk about the music because they did a lot of great music. A lot of the new Tina fans or the newer that love her 
for her solo career as a solo artist. Maybe don't like all of the Ike and Tina stuff so much, but I'm really into it. I love all of those albums. And I especially love the fact that on so many of the Ike and Tina albums, Tina wrote so many songs. And people don't know that Tina was a very busy songwriter at that time. A lot of people only think that she wrote Not Bush City Limits about her hometown in Tennessee. But she wrote a lot of the, most of the songs on the Feel Good album, even on Let Me Touch Your Mind, uh, also on the Nut Bush album, on um, Delilah's Power, and uh, Sweet Rhode Island Red, and a lot of those albums that they did during those years. And I love all of those songs. I love some of the rougher songs that she wrote. Nut Bush, Chopper, um, Delilah's Power, and all those powerful songs that they did. A brilliant album is Working Together, of course, and the title song is also Working Together is written by Ike under the name that he turned around, all of the letters he turned around to Ikai Renroot, Ike Turner, which is a funny thing. Rhonda wrote a song as well. Aline, Tina's sister, also wrote Funkier Than a Mosquito's Tweeter and which was later covered, a very interesting cover version of that song by Nina Simone. And other people have done that as well. And also their 60s music was quite good. A lot of it, some of it was better than others. And you hear how Tina's voice is developing enormously from 1960 with A Fool in Love and I Idolized You, You Should Have Treated Me Right and all of that in the beginning up to River Deep, Mountain High, Phil Spector, and all of what we know. And then later on with some of the later 60s stuff, The Hunter, So Fine, and um, um, Come Together, which was a very interesting album. And they also did some political songs on that album, and I really liked that as well. That was very interesting. Some very, very good songs that was, you know, very fitting for the time during the youth rebellion, sexual revolution, and everything that, and feminist revolution that happened in, in the 60s. And um, there are so many shows. If I could time travel, I would go to Egypt, ancient Egypt, but I would also choose, if I had two choices, the first choice would, go, would be to go and see an Ike and Tina Turner concert in 1971 or in 1972. Those are the two years I'd prefer if I had to choose. So uh, I had the amazing opportunity to meet Ike Turner himself in 2007 on his very last tour, the last time, one of the last concerts he performed, I guess. I don't know. That I don't know, but I know it was the last tour. It was in the summer, and he died in the late fall of the early winter. I think maybe in December of 2007. Uh, people didn't know that he was back on cocaine and you know everybody knew that he had been clean and, and, and all of that. So I guess it was, a, it was a sad thing that he relapsed and, uh, and went back on that. But the fact that he came to Denmark and did a show was incredible. I thought, wow, this is the opportunity to finally see Ike, see what it's all about, see him in person, see him perform, and see, you know, how his band works and, and, and who he has on the stage. Because he had worked with several of his later wives after Tina. There was a white wife and there was a black wife, and, and they were both really good, and they did brilliant uh, things together, I think. You know, they, they weren't Tina, but, you know, who is? And he tried maybe to Tina them up a bit, like this reporter said, um, but um, you can't do that. And uh, it's not, it may, although Tina may be Ike's invention, Whatever it is that I've talked about for a long time that Tina has is not something Ike can invent. It's not something he can create. But he could create the platform, the show, the style, and he did brilliantly. But whatever Tina is, 
and her talent for as a singer and as a performer that's her own unique thing and nobody can touch that but everybody sings with their own voice and everybody is their own unique performer so of course those other people that he he had on later on did their own thing and uh what you can say about Ike's show, which was brilliant for me to watch, but maybe not so uh, revolutionary, was that he didn't really change. He didn't evolve so much. It was still the old Ike and Tina stuff. It was still the same introduction, the intros, the, the music. All of it was kind of the same, which was amazing because it was almost like a flashback, as close as I could get to see a real Ike and Tina show. He didn't have one of his wives uh, there uh, on 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 that on that day. Her name, the the lady who was singing on the stage, was Lyrica Garrett. Lyrica Garrett, and she was amazing. She was very close to Tina, very wonderful, powerful, and everything. I said, "Wow, this is really like a Tina copy, but a good one." But what I actually discovered after that was that Lyrica Garrett, who had been performing with Ike there in, in Denmark and on his last tour, was Marcy Thomas, who was a former Iket. And no wonder she was a bit like Tina. Tina trained her. It was all Tina. And it was amazing. And she was wonderful. I met her at 7 o'clock in the morning at the Hotel Grand in, in Odense, uh, uh, the third biggest town in, in Denmark where they performed. And I spoke to this, there was a white uh, guy who was like the tour manager and he was also on stage, he was really great. And I spoke to him and he said, well, if, you're gonna, if you want to meet, uh, meet Ike, it has to be, you know, we have to leave at seven o'clock in the morning, so you have to be there. And I said, wow, this is, that's, it's early. And I had to go and perform in the night. And I was all gothed up, goth, long hair and uh, dark around the eyes because I had to go to a party in the night, like a goth party and do a couple of songs. And uh, I remember, oh, I can't drink very much because, you know, I had to be there in the, at the hotel in the morning. So about four o'clock or five or something, I went, five o'clock maybe, I went to that hotel and just stayed there. And I think around six or something or five, or I don't know, some of those musicians were in the, uh, in the uh, foyer, in the reception of the hotel. And I spoke to these older gentlemen who turned out to be band members of the Kings and Rhythm from the 70s, who'd been working with Ike for 40, 50 years, who played on Nutbush City Limits. And I spoke to them and they, we spoke about Tina as well. And, and they said, oh, he should have kept that one. I remember word for word, one of them saying that, saying that she was always really nice, very nice and, and didn't go into details, but just saying that, you know, they really treasured her back then. So that was nice to hear. So, um, I got to meet Ike Jr., um, Ike's son uh, by Lorraine, but he was raised by Tina, like all of the four sons uh, were. And um, he was really great, really nice guy. He gave me his email address so I could send him pictures that I took uh, of the show the night before. I had my camera, I was there first front row, and. Had a great time uh, seeing the show. That was really brilliant. It was really great. So funky, so bluesy, rhythm and blues and rock and roll. And then Ike came down, and I thought, "Wow, this is how is how is this going to turn out?" You know, I you hear you've heard all of these things all of those years. How how is the energy going to be? You know, you sense the vibration of a person. At least I do, as an intuitive. I work with that, so I am very much into feeling what's, you know, how is, how is the mood? So he came, it was like really early in the morning and I looked like this and I think he looked, it thought, he, he thought, my, oh my God, who, what is that? <laughs> what is, who is that standing there? And I'm, I was towering, I'm tall and he was not very tall. And you know, he's like, the, 
So, yeah, uh, you know, it was like little standing back a little bit. Said, okay. And I said, can I say hello? And I introduced myself saying I just spoke to Ike Jr. And the, and the guy, I don't remember his name. That was the tour manager or whatever he was. And also on the stage, a white guy, really great m musician. And, and we took some pictures. I, rem I think maybe Ike Jr. took those pictures of me and, 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 and Ike. Or maybe that guy, I don't remember exactly who took them, but I think maybe it was, it was Ike Jr. I, I can't remember, but I think so. Um, and he was very nice. Uh, it was very early and Lyrica Garrett, I had spoken to before and she said, oh my God, this is exhausting. We have to go at, at, at seven o'clock. No wonder she'd just been on the stage of, you know, some hours before. But that was the style of Ike, you know, they worked hard and even to the last day. So um, it was late, it was early in the morning <laughs> and late in his life. But I got a chance to be there. He was quite nice and gave me quite some time. And when we spoke and I said about, yeah, you know, I have, I've been following your career. I have all of the old, all of your old albums with Tina. He signed a couple and, and it was a brilliant moment. And I treasure that moment. I'm very happy that I've had this opportunity, not only to see him live, but also to meet him because it was, it was kind of a fascinating thing, you know, and a brilliant thing. And I think he was a very talented musician and the first guy in history, in the history of rock and roll, who did a rock and roll song, rock and, Rocket 88. So um, f to me, their legacy is clear. The music is brilliant. It speaks for itself. There may have been a lot of heartache, but there was a lot of talent, a lot of brilliance, a lot of hard work and a lot of history. And uh, that is very uh, valuable. And we must also remember Ike and Tina for, for that and and what and what Ike did uh, himself. He managed to also get a Grammy Award that year, so at least something good came to him. Although, you know, I don't think Tina ever fully recovered from uh, the abuse, and I don't think she forgave him until much later, but uh, that is all for people to see in this documentary, which could have been a little lighter, which could have been a uh, little bit more happy with, you know, imagine the success that she had in the 80s and the 90s. And lots of songs were left out. Not Bushes, Not There, Steamy Windows, Not There, Acid Queen, Not There, Let's Stay Together, Not There, all of the later albums, Not There. However, the way it's made is brilliant and the song selections are also very, very good. So the reason I was asked to do this video about my experiences with Tina Turner as a child and as a teenager and a little bit later on. It's of course because of this documentary coming out and sadly it appears that it is her final farewell to fans and to everybody who's been following her in her life. So it's a, a bittersweet experience. Of course, it's sad for all of the fans, even though we, everybody thinks and knows that she deserves the rest and the retirement. And because of the fact that she's been ill for several years, you know, everybody hopes that she's gonna stay well and keep holding on and staying strong for many, many years because her presence on this earth is still a beacon of light. So um, let's hope that everything will turn out very fine for her and that she will have many wonderful years and can enjoy her retirement, even though it's sad for a lot of us. It, it just is. That's how it is. You know, we, even though we understand, it is sad and it's difficult. The musical is great. People can go and see it whenever they open up again. I think I've spoken for way too long now and, uh, you know, there are so many things I can still go on about and tell you about. And it could, I could go on for hours and hours, but this has been way too long already. 
and there are many, many more stories to tell. And, you know, I had to really go back in my memory bank to remember all of these things. And it's been a lot of fun, I have to say, to, to, to do this. And I, I'm happy I got to do it. So, uh, but there are many things I haven't remembered right now. And maybe I'll think, oh, I should have included that anyway. A lot of it is there and, you know, it's been a, a lot of fun. That's basically what it is. A lot of fun um, having to experience Tina Turner, the Queen of Rock. She's the most brilliant and she forever will be. I will never be interested in any other artist. Uh, and I can like, I like certain artists, but this one is special. And I'm so happy I got in there so early that I got to experience all of that. Because now that the world is changing, and not only the entire world is changing, but also the music scene is changing, we don't have personalities like that anymore. We don't have a star like Tina. We don't have anybody who is that unique. We just don't. She, she was unique. She still is unique. And I am deeply happy and very, very grateful to have been present on this planet Earth on the same timeline as Tina Turner. That is what I'm grateful for. I think people can enjoy watching the new HBO documentary, Tina, and enjoy all of the songs and the catalog of different music she's done since 1960 with Ike and then her solo career. I wish everybody the best, simply the best, and lots of love, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to tell a little bit of my story in all of this. It was an interesting journey to go, to go on here and remember all of those fun memories. What lasts is Beautiful, beautiful memories that I'll always have with me, I'll never forget, and lots of great friendships. So thank you, Tina, and thanks to all of those who were around her. Thank you.